Handheld gaming's come a long way since the days of the original Game Boy and playing Tetris off of four AA batteries. Yet, yeah, things have changed a little bit, right? We've gone from that all the way up to now where we're taking Crisis, Doom, Witcher, on the go with us. But there was this time where we viewed handheld games as essentially lesser than for console quality games, right? I mean, we would look at the handheld stuff as pretty cool, but not like what we would play on the Xbox 360 or the PlayStation 3, nothing like that. So there was this bridge between those. And to me, that bridge was the Vita. Now, I know you can say the 3DS had some graphically impressive games as well and ones that felt like console quality games, but something about the Vita and when I first saw Uncharted on it really made me wake up and say, wow, are we about to get to the point where unthinkable games could make their way to a handheld device? And yeah, they did. I mean, we had, we had Doom unveiled for the Switch or Witcher and that blew minds. So today I wanted to look at a system that Sony seemed to forget about years after it was released. I mean, it felt like it should have been the middle of the console or the, or the handheld generation, I should say. And Sony just kind of abandoned it, probably because the PlayStation 4 had taken off. But I wanted to open it up, show you around it a bit, share my thoughts, and uh, talk a bit about the PlayStation Vita today, specifically the original 1000 model. And a big shout out to today's sponsor, Audible. Now, if you're like me, you might be kind of bored inside right now. What I've been trying to do is spend some time every day or so getting some exercise, walking or running for about an hour. I've decided to spend some of that time also catching up on some audiobooks, and Audible has enabled me to do that very easily. See, Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, and they have a ton of stuff, thousands of different audiobooks to pick from, and you can download titles and listen to them anytime, anywhere, which works out great at the park near me where there is no service. If you're looking for a recommendation to get you started on Audible, I have been working through Masters of Doom recently. It's an almost 13 hour listen, but it is narrated by Will Wheaton, which is kind of fun. It does follow John Carmack and John Romero as they work to build up Idsoft, and it pretty much starts off in their early days, and that the dynamic between the two vastly different personalities as they work to build up to Doom while also building Commander Keen and Wolfenstein 3D has just been fascinating. Audible has a free 30-day trial, and you can check that out with the link down below in the description, audible.com slash spawnwave, or you can text spawnwave to 500-500. That's audible.com slash spawnwave. Once again, thanks to Audible for sponsoring the video. Now, if we take a look at the Vita itself on the front, you can pretty much see that Sony had the idea of this playing what would be dubbed, I guess, console quality games immediately. Two analog sticks, of course, D-pad, all of the face buttons you would expect on a PlayStation controller right in front of us. Also had the home button, start, select, and then on the back, we did have a rear touchpad, which was weird. You can see it tracks fingerprints very, very easily. They just kind of accumulate, but that really, to me, showed that Sony was gonna throw the kitchen sink at this thing. We had a front touchpad, we had a back touchpad, we had cameras on the front and the back. It was all over the place with different things that Sony was trying with it. Now, I had to repair quite a few of these Vitas throughout my time of doing repairs on consoles. Vitas would come in, surprisingly, I say surprisingly because there weren't that many out there. While this did technically outsell the Wii U, compared to the PSP before it, it sold significantly less. Compared to the 3DS next to it, it sold significantly less. So I would see them come in, but it was definitely less than other devices. Now I got this one from GameStop because they had a deal going on where like for a day, these things were like $100 or something. I think it was like $90 for a Vita 1000 specifically. And I wanted a 1000 because while I do have uh, two of the 2000 models, the 1000 model has an OLED screen. So like the OLED screen, I think is a lot nicer than the LCD that they changed over to, but we'll get into that in, in a little bit. On the back though, we have some Phillips head screws. There's four of them on the back and then there are a couple on the bottom and then the top that we have to unscrew. Now, before we rip the back off, we do have to take out the memory card. And this was 
One of Sony's downfalls is that they did use these proprietary memory cards. This is an eight gigabyte and it's roughly the cost of a mortgage payment for your house. Now, the, the problem they really ran into was that while they were using memory cards, the 3DS just used straight up SD cards that were much cheaper. The reason Sony said that they went with these memory cards is because they wanted a baseline speed for the system to be able to access the memory card through. So like they, they knew you weren't gonna be using a slower SD card. That whole thing wasn't an issue for Nintendo with the 3DS, but based on what Sony was trying to do with the Vita, they just wanted to be sure that everything would work across the board. And that meant that they were going to produce their own memory cards to sell you at a premium. And now that I think about it, this is the same reasoning that we just got from Microsoft for the Series X and why that's using its memory cards. Anyway, with the memory card, any game cards out, we can start popping the back off. These are just little doors and flaps that kind of fall off. And you can see the back just kind of opens up. You have to unplug the back touchpad and then you got our battery connector here. And you can see the battery sits in its housing back here and it's pretty easy to change out. It has a couple of screws here for a bracket. This pulls out and you can put a new one in, which was nice. It wasn't as easy, of course, as the 3DS, as that just had a door that popped off and it just kind of slid out. But this wasn't too bad. It was the first thing that came out and that made it pretty easy. Now there are connectors and sensors, cables all back here. And that was mostly for the touchpad, which was used in some games. I remember using it mostly in remote play. Although I do also remember things like uh, Katamari where I used it for that. But for the most part, that would be assigned to uh, remote play games. You cross your fingers and hope for that since each remote play game kind of had its own setup, which was a little annoying at the time because I would never know how they wanted me to press certain buttons, whether they would assign like L3 and R3 to like the front touch screen or the back. It was kind of anyone's guess. So this is the best part. When you get the back off and you look down at the board and kind of the inside of the system, you'll notice something right away. This handheld is extremely modular, which is great for anyone who's trying to repair this system. I mean, take a look at this. All the boards are kind of on their own and they all plug into your main board here. So that makes things very, very easy to kind of work through. Now, the funny part about this system, I said I got it from GameStop and usually you'd have color coded screws for the Vita, this does not. So I almost wonder if they just put different screws in or this one just didn't come with them. Usually you'd have like blue and purple screws, uh, but I'm just seeing all blue screws here, which is a little annoying because that was actually a pretty cool feature that they had. So I'm removing this plastic shield and that was covering this card right here. And this is our wireless card. It of course will communicate to your, uh, your spot at home, whether you have a wireless router or if you're on the go and you happen to be using their 3G service through AT&T, this card was responsible for it. It's fully socketed and I assume that's because they had Wi-Fi models and they had models that could communicate to mobile towers. This was once again, something that probably was unnecessary for the Vita. They used 3G and I'll really never understand why. See at the time, I guess this was what, 2010? I guess 4G wasn't quite what it is now obviously, but it was still kind of in its early days and they decided to go with 3G probably because of battery technology or like battery was pretty bad still with 4G. I'm trying to remember when the Thunderbolt came out for 4G, but I remember when that did, it was like an hour of battery when you had 4G on, which wasn't very good. But I have to imagine there were a lot of factors still at play and 3G, you couldn't really do much with it. You would use near, which would tell you like where you were and where you're walking and stuff and would kind of be street pass for Vita. And I think there were some games that were like turn-based you could play where you would send a move and then they send it back. Kind of like what mobile games do now with like words with friends, for example. No, they instead went with 3G and it really didn't work out that well. Also, they had that fun reveal where they told everyone that you're gonna use AT&T. Now, of course, having such an impressive set of network features and ambitions requires the nation's fastest mobile broadband network. And we'll be partnering with AT&T as the exclusive carrier for PlayStation Vita in the United States. There we go. I mean, I'm not even there. It's 10 years later and I still want to boo. I'll never understand why they didn't just have an unlocked SIM card slot in the Vita. That would have been so much better if you could have just gone out 
picked your provider, whether it was like T-Mobile, AT&T, uh, Verizon, Sprint, wherever, and then you just connected up that way because they were assuming that you had AT&T and you could link it to your plan when not everyone did, and of course you were locked in. There was no choice to use what felt like a fairly revolutionary idea for a gaming dedicated handheld. It's something that I think would be really cool on the next Switch to have 4G connectivity, but unfortunately we had 3G and it was AT&T with the Vita. Anyway, from there we have several boards and there, like I said before, it was all modular. So a couple of screws and we can get to different things, whether it's the button board for uh, the D-pad or the button board for where triangle, square, etc., is. And you can just replace those as needed. It was actually really, really cool. You also have a ribbon cable here that gets unplugged, at which point you can pick this up and just change out the analog stick. That is also a cable that runs to it. I mean, check this out. Even your shoulder buttons are just cables that plug in and those would take a beating as you would sit there and mash them and they're your basic uh, rubber membrane style. So they would go bad, but it was very easy to just change out. These are like little stickers that you peel up, you put a new one down, you plug it in, you're good to go. See with the board out, you can take a look at our buttons here. They're just kind of tactile presses. So they have that nice click to them. Then you also have your uh, your other buttons down here, start and select, and that just kind of goes to the side just like that. You could buy these boards for fairly cheap as well. So if like you spill something into this side of the Vita, there's a chance it wouldn't even affect the motherboard and you would just buy this piece, replace it, and you're good to go. It's one of the reasons I really like that they were so modular with this design. It made a system that was pretty expensive at the time, very easy to, to fix and replace parts on so that they made sense to repair. And you can see our analog stick here, just a few screws hold that in. This pops out, a new one pops in, and you pretty much just plug it in and go. Super easy. You can also see up here, we have our power button. We also have our volume rockers over here. That also just plugs in right there. And power buttons, of course, can get jammed in over time, pressing it over and over again. Very easy to replace. You can see the camera here also is just a plug-in for the back. After you get the screw out that's kind of hiding underneath of it, the whole motherboard just comes right up. So now let's talk about some things that were more of a pain to replace. One was the screen. Most likely, if the screen was broken, you were just gonna order a whole front assembly, which for the first year or so of the system's life did not make any sense because it was too expensive. The OLED screen definitely cost Sony some money, and that's why they moved away from it with the 2000 where they introduced an LCD instead. So whenever that would happen, we would pretty much say, hey, you might as well go buy another one. It's just, it's not worth it. Uh, eventually they got a bit cheaper. You'd order the front assembly. You'd move all of these parts over to that plastics and then you'd close it up and it was fine. But for a while it was, it was not working out. Now let's move over to the motherboard itself. And there are a few things that I was not a fan of on here when I had to work on them. One is the memory card slot. You can see that is just soldered on. It's not a separate piece, something like, for example, the switch has, which is that this plugs in. The charge port is proprietary to it, and that also is soldered to it. It's not on a separate board, which is annoying. Headphone jack, same deal. And then you also have the game card slot being the same deal as well. When we got to this point, all of those major components that should be something you could change out on other platforms like the switch, or I'll just solder to the main board. So with these panels off that are pretty much just pushed in on each side and kind of grab, you have to lift them up and help them off essentially. But once you get those off, you can have a look at all the different chips. Uh, the main one that we want to look at is this guy right here. That's our pretty much system on a chip. It has everything from what I can tell, including even from what I've seen, the memory which is an interesting design for them to go with, but it is ARM based, it's an ARM Cortex A9 quad core. And then the GPU is an SGX 543 MP4 plus. It has 512 megabytes of RAM. And what this was mostly compared to from what I remember was the iPad 3. The only difference of course being this is a dedicated handheld, not necessarily something that was used for all kinds of stuff like the iPad was, which was like a multifunction device. This, for the most part, was designed just to play games. It had some other features, of course. You could uh, even do voice chat on it technically, but they did have different apps and everything. But for the most part, 
Developers were creating stuff for it, specifically for games, taking advantage of that chip. It was also working off of a lower resolution, of course, with this screen here, which was 960 by 554. That OLED screen really looked nice, but the resolution was much lower, so they were able to get away with more, obviously, than what you had with the iPad 3. I think the biggest takeaway here, though, one, obviously the board's fairly small, but two, it doesn't have a fan. This is technically still the most powerful passively cooled gaming handheld. The Switch needs a fan, this doesn't. So it's still very impressive for that, but of course you see differences visually between the Switch and the Vita by quite a bit. And of course the Switch is working with a screen that has a higher resolution as well. Either way, for the ARM chip that it's using, if you compare it to something like that iPad 3, this punches well above its weight class, right? I mean, you see Uncharted, the iPad doesn't really have anything like that. So there's still a lot to be said about developers who are developing for a specific system and getting as much as they can out of it. Unfortunately though, after just the first couple of years for the Vita, I guess slowing sales or just not really great sales at all had Sony kind of moving away from it. And it does make me wonder what a game like later on in its life would have looked like. I think Killzone, Killzone might be the best looking game on the Vita overall, I think anyway. If you really sit down and play it, it looked, it's very impressive. But I almost wonder what could have been in like the system's sixth year, like, like way later when you see really developers pull a lot out of systems. That's like when you get like the last big game. I almost wonder what would have happened. And you know what, I also wonder what would Sony have done with a successor to the Vita? Because at this point, we, we see the Switch with the Tegra X1, what, what would have Sony done? Unfortunately, to be honest, I don't think we'll ever see that. I, I don't think Sony's interested in the handheld market at all anymore, or even the hybrid market, even though it seems like a lot of people are interested in it. Consumers obviously like the idea of being able to play your games at home or take it with you, your choice but I just don't think Sony is. So unfortunately, this is probably the last hurrah, I guess you'd say, for a handheld device from Sony that's dedicated to gaming. You could see maybe a cell phone or something from them. I don't know what we had, the Xperia Play, but nothing like this. So uh, hey, fans will probably continue to really like the Vita and continue to give it life after it was discontinued with the hacking community, which has done some amazing things. They replaced that terrible SD card or the terrible SIM card with an SD card at one point. They also made it so that after you do uh, hack the system and open it up, you can just change out the game cards for SD cards. So like there are some really cool things that are being done with the Vita. I just wish Sony had given it more of a chance and it could have got some really cool support uh, further from Japanese developers who are still actually supporting this thing. What could have been, right? What could have been? But thanks guys for watching. Let me know what you think about the Vita down below. I gotta put this guy back together and probably play some Persona on it. Thanks guys for watching. Make sure you like the video on the way out if you enjoyed it. Dislike it if not. And I'll see you next time.